Jason. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, I'm sure more will jump on, but thanks for joining us. It's our first slug meeting of the virtual COVID times. I'm Adrian Welsh, one of the slug board members, and the rest of us are all scattered on this thing. And um, we'll just see how it goes. If you have questions, there's a chat box you can ask questions into. We'll be looking at that as we go along. And uh, record there with the utility itself. Raise your hand. Down a lot of that utility. And if you want to, you can mute yourself so we don't hear lots of background noise. Um, but to get started, I think somebody from UGIC has an update for giving us some update what's happening in the UGIC world. Um, Christina, do you know who we have on the line for that? You know, it was supposed to be Nick, and my job was to email him so that he remembered, and I, of course, forgot. So, I don't see him in the, in the list of participants right now, but let's go ahead and get started with maybe our first presentation. I will email Nick right now, and hopefully he'll jump on. Cool. Yeah, that's that great. Right? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Unless somebody here wants to just jump in who is with slug and has updates, but we can also just wait. It's not a big deal. Um, but for the first presentation, we have Bert Granberg and the WFRC crew. And so Bert, if you want to um, start presenting and share your screen, we'll just get going that way. How's that? There we go. Good. Okay. Oh, there's Nick. If he's ready, then certainly go back to him, but. Oh, go for it. And then he can talk okay. when you're done. <laughs> um, all right, well, um, great to be here. This is, this is fun. Um, this is probably, you know, the 956th Zoom meeting <laughs> since since the COVID era began, but um, glad to see kind of the GIS community pulling together to, to share some things and hopefully we've got some interesting things to share. Um, our presentation today, um, Matthew Silski and um, Nicole Mendelson are, are joining in. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about some of the work that we're doing at WFRC, um, show you some web apps and some data resources that may be of interest, um, may be useful, um, may be something that um, you can help us with um, and um, kind of collaborate in the future. So um, I think I'll start um, with a quick intro, just reminding folks um, a little bit about WFRC. We are the Metro Metropolitan Planning Organization um, and Association of Governments um, for the Salt Lake Davis Weber um, area. Uh, also, we work a little bit in the, up to Brigham City, um, some of the travel modeling we do, and um, we collaborate with Tula County and Morgan County uh, for rural planning um, purposes. So we're, we're a regional government entity. Um, we have kind of a, a mission that um, touches a lot of transportation, um, land use, and economic development. Um, we're a staff of 30 and the analytics group, uh, which Nicole and Matthew and I are all part of, is about seven folks. We do a lot of GIS um, in support of transportation planning, uh, visioning exercises, um, and specifically for um, two big kind of products that WFRC helps to produce. One is a short range transportation program, which is done in collaboration with UDOT and UTA. And that contains in the next, that looks out four to six years and contains about three to $4 billion in transportation projects. We also work on a long range transportation plan or a region, RTP for short, um, that gets produced every four years. And that um, most recent plan was adopted in 2019. And again, working with UDOT and UTA, um, local government, um, that, uh, that RTP plans out um, $23 billion of transportation spend through 2050. And we also have a, a small um, group that works on regional economic development um, issues and uh, local planning projects, which is called uh, through something called the Transportation Land Use Connection. 
So um, we're regional government, your um, mayors, commissioners, council persons are our immediate stakeholders and participate in our board and committees. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of the intro. <laughs> So um, to do all that, um, you know, we're involved in, in lots of things, um, again, at the regional scale. Um, if it relates to transportation planning, uh, coordination of investments, uh, visioning and land use, economic development, then um, we're interested and often involved uh, in working on those issues. And I just put together a little word cloud of kind of the, the topics that um, you know, over the course of the year that, that we're um, involved in um, coordinating with local government, also at the state level, or kind of sandwiched in between, but um, lots and lots of different topics. Uh, transportation and land use are so important that um, they relate to just about anything and everything. Um, and um, to, to work on all this these types of issues, we've got to find the right balance. Um, we've got to play that regional role, do things at a regional scale, and find synergies with what's being done at the city and county level, but also um, up at the, the state level. One of our challenges is working, um, playing um, what we do, what we produce to, to a variety of audiences. Um, that includes elected officials on our, our board um, and committees but also technical staff at the city and county level and, and also in um, UDOT and UTA and, and other um, state level agencies. So often when we're building things like web applications, we're trying to find that right balance point between something that's powerful and user friendly um, that provides an overview or, or really specific um, detail. And uh, that's just kind of a constant challenge and sometimes we end up building different products for different audiences. Um, we also um, are really interested in current conditions and trends, but also um, with those short range and long range transportation plans, um, a lot of the work we do, and I think this is where what we do is a little bit different than a lot of typical GIS users. Like we're, we're working into the future and doing things like um, forecasting with models. And, um, all of this has to be balanced appropriately, and I think maybe um, a really good place to start to show how we um, are trying to, to do all of this at once and find that balance point is to uh, transition to Matthew Silsky, um, who's going to um, talk us through one of the projects we have, which is the Wasatch Choice Interactive Map. And Matthew, are, are you there? Yep, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. So, so as Bert mentioned, uh, maybe some of you have seen this before, the Wasatch Choice Map. Uh, we released it about a year ago. It was a custom web app that uh, was built with a lot of help from AGRC. And it, it brings together our efforts to plan for regional and uh, regional transportation and land use. Uh, it's, as you can see, it kind of looks like a tab story map series. So each each tab is its own focus area, like transportation, economic development, and, and more. The first tab is actually a, a recreation of our Wasatch Choice Vision poster, which you may have seen at Maps on the Hill earlier this year. So in September, uh, just this year, we rolled out a new release of a map that allows, that can give the user the ability to add additional tabs to the map through this uh, gear icon. So by clicking the gear icon, it will open up an interface uh, for, for configuring additional tabs. And here's what it looks like. The, so the user can toggle over which map he or she would like to see. Right now we have six additional tabs that can be added to the map, which is kind of cool. Uh, we plan on adding more in the future. Uh, so I think next we're, we'll talk about some uh, web maps and data sets that we've recently created. And many of these you can find as standalone tabs in this Wasatch Choice Map. Uh, we, this Wasatch Choice Map is kind of a one-stop shop for a lot of our data, so it's a good place to go to. Uh, so next slide. So one of the 
big accomplishments this year for our group was the completion of a generalized future land use map and inventory. It contains the general plan or best available future land use uh, for our area cities and counties. Uh, we had a lot of help from two students at the University of Utah, Marissa Snyder and Emma McPhee. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, they reached out to all of all of our cities, so talking around 50, to obtain their best available land use data. So ideally these were map services, but some of these were PDFs, which we had to digitize. Uh, that wasn't a lot of fun, uh, but we did it. Uh, this this map is there. There's so many land use types out there you know, that we decided to generalize them, thus the generalized future land use map. Uh, so uh, the next slide shows a uh, zoomed in uh, a zoomed in view of the map. Uh, go back one. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the no problem. The it it shows it zoomed in. Uh, there's the URL up top. Uh, yeah, <laughs> rough task, yep. Uh, so in the pop-up, we included some source information from the cities uh, uh, for interest and also transparency. And for convenience, we included the, the plan, the general plan link, and also the link to the data where we got it from. We, we plan to use this, well, we've already seen some good internal use from it, but while we expect uh, good external use as well. Uh, this is a publicly available map. Uh, so one, one note, uh, if there are any city GIS staff online on the call right now, I, I would invite you to take a look at the map. Please do and reach out to me or Bert or Nicole if there's a better data source for the map, if there's a newer one or whatever, uh, reach out to us and, and we'll update the map. Uh, actually just a just a few weeks ago, I had two, uh, two jurisdictions reach out to me with some up-to-date uh, up data, and it wasn't too hard for me to go and, and make the change in the map, and it's already live. So, so I, I'll get that data in once you get it to me. So uh, next slide. The, on the transportation side of things, we continue to maintain two uh, two maps, a uh, short range transportation planning map, the transportation for the transportation improvement program, and also a long range, uh, long term, uh, or for our long, our long range plan, the regional transportation plan. Uh, these are great resources if you want to see what's planned in your area, uh, short term and long term. UDOT maintains the, the TIP data, the transportation improvement program data, the short term stuff and we maintain the, the long-term data which was also recently updated. So uh, I, I think at this point I'll turn the time back to Bert to share more of our transportation and uh, population related data sets and maps. Great, thank you Matthew. I mean this is these maps are I talked about the bill you know a couple of billion in the short um, term um, program the next four to six years and and 23 billion in the regional transportation plan. These maps are where you can go find out the details of um, what modes that's being invested in and the specific projects and budgets and uh, either the, the year in the terms of or for the short short term program that it's expected to start or the sort of phase period for the long range plan when um, those projects are expected to come online. All right, so trend, um, switching gears a little bit um, when we're doing our, our transportation modeling um, in the future um, and land use modeling, um, we are, are dependent on creating a projection for a set of projections for where people are going to live and work in the future. And uh, you know, one of the important inputs is that, that um, general plan layer that Matthew just showed, um, which, gets at like what the future uh, land use types are in our area and what the, the ceiling is in terms of how much that it can develop. So uh, before we start doing travel modeling um, and looking at, at trips and volumes and things like that, we put together um, a set of 
uh, what we call socioeconomic projections. They're done at the traffic analysis zone level um, and kind of get a sense um, for how big those are from the graphic on the left. There are 2,800 of the traffic analysis zones up and down the Wasatch Front and including the model space in uh, Utah County that we collaborate on with Mountain Land Association of Governments. So this, um, these projections uh, we have uh, on our open data site and we have a population, um, household count and job count by kind of generalized sector for each of the years through uh, 2050. And we have these at the finer grain traffic analysis zone level, those 2,800 polygons, but we also roll the, the TAZs up into things that look like city boundaries. Uh, we call those city areas. They're, they're pretty close. Uh, and so we make this data available um, for folks to use, but also to review and provide us um, feedback on. And we'll be reaching out to, to cities um, probably a year, 12 to 18 months from now to get um, sort of a detailed um, review and uh, feedback for our, our next round of projections. Typically we update them about every four years. Okay. So um, with that sort of future land use and where people live and where they work, um, we're able to use our travel demand models to forecast what the volumes will be um, on major roads in our region. Um, and this, um, this data set is, is available. Um, it's fairly complex. And one of the things that we did this year is we built a viewer, uh, really a, kind of a, a detailed um, viewer for um, the projected travel volumes. And uh, this viewer actually also includes um, observed data since 2000. And then you can see, actually you can see in the chart in the lower left corner how we've blended together the observed data and the darker gray circles with the forecasted um, data going forward, the lighter uh, squares. So the user interface, um, custom user interface, allows people to pick a, um, a, a year um, of the forecast. Uh, they can also look at the amount of change between periods. Um, and we also have an advanced um, viewer. You can see in that green square in the upper right corner, you can toggle between sort of the simple view um, and the advanced view. And the advanced view look, lets you look at the forecasted volumes um, together with the population and employment forecasts in the background. Um, and I should mention that, that, um, that this viewer actually, it works for the WFRC area and the MAG area in Utah County, but we, we're working with UDOT to expand it so that um, in most cases it has statewide level traffic forecasts and um, population and employment projections. We've got a few more things to to move into this, but that's the vision is that this would provide this information statewide. Okay, um, one more switch of gears. Um, one of the things we've look, worked on uh, in the last couple of years is something we call access to opportunities or ATO. And this is um, basically, it's, it's a GIS analysis that builds on the land use model and the socioeconomics that it creates where people live, where they work together with the travel model, which tells us how fast we can get around during the peak periods. And um, this access to opportunities um, set of data is really, it's a framework for looking at how well our region's transportation system and its land uses are synergistically working together. So really, I mean, it's, that's kind of a long-winded explanation, a short, um, explanation is that we're looking at mobility, how fast people can travel, and then proximity, how far apart are people from the things that they need, like a workplace and basic amenities. So mobility plus proximity gives us accessibility, and we've got a lot of data sets that depict this, um, kind of give us a view of the landscape for how well things are working together now, but in some cases we can also look at how well they'll look um, how well ATO will look in the future. So there are three ATO data sets that we have um, available. One is workplace accessibility. And this is looking, um, basically it's like 
it's, it's an update to how many jobs are within 30 minutes. Um, these data sets will, will tell you, at, again, at the uh, traffic analysis zone level, um, how many jobs are within a typical commute, either by transit or by car. And we can look at it, we've looked at it from the perspective of households getting to jobs, but also um, businesses who have an interest in employees or um, customers coming to them. So that's the workplace accessibility data set. Um, we've got uh, a web page that has maps for each specific area of our region um, broken out like the examples in the, in the lower right corner, which are for the Ogden area. Uh, you can see how well that landscape is performing for travel by car on the left and travel by transit on the right. The second ATO data set is um, we call it, sometimes we call it nearby commute intensity. I think that that's what the data set is actually called in our open data set. But it's really, um, it's looking at household intensity, um, the map on the left, and also uh, job intensity across the region, which is the map on the right. Um, and it basically, it's, think of it as a big raster grid, um, although it's, it's actually a really vector, but think of it as a grid of, of squares about the size of a city block. And we have summed up the number of jobs and the number of households that are within a quarter mile of each grid cell. And we use this for some of our project prioritization scoring. Um, the third data set is access to key destinations. And um, we haven't done a ton of work with this yet. The example that I've got is a couple of years old showing um, drive time to grocery stores. I think the important point here is that um, we're gonna be doing this in the future and we've, we've built many of the destination data sets uh, and have them available for our region um, on our open data page. So community centers, uh, community services, grocery stores, hospital and clinics, parks and recreation, retail centers, schools, transit stations. Some of these, of course, we borrowed from, from other data sets, but um, we've staged them, they're ready to use for this type of um, a network analysis, whether it's by car, by transit, or potentially by bike or walking. Um, these ATO data sets, if you're interested in more detail, um, you can just Google search WFRC and ATO and you'll find our page that describes this um, in depth and provides links to those uh, small area maps for, um, I, think maybe, I think we've got 13 different sort of small area looks at workplace accessibility. All right, I'm gonna take a break and turn it uh, to Nicole, who's gonna talk about some of the things she's been working on. Nicole, are you there? Uh, sorry, wait, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, great. Okay, uh, so the, couple, the first app application I'm gonna share is our active uh, transportation and GIS data resources map. So over the last year, We've worked with staff from UDOT, AGRC, and MAG, um, and local cities to compile and update active transportation data sets. And um, for those of you that don't know, active transportation is um, like bicycling, walking, anything that isn't driving a vehicle for, uh, for transportation purposes. Um, so we've had a rich, comprehensive roadway data sets for a while. Um, and now we have that same quality of data for active transportation facilities. Um, we work to integrate and store existing and planned active transportation facilities in an established and well-known system. That I'm sure you all um, have used before the road center lines data and the trails and pathways GIS data sets um, that are distributed by AGRC. Um, we feel that consistent, high-quality, publicly available data enables better inventory, visualization, and communication of existing and planned facilities, and better analysis of our AT network's performance. So um, an important part of it is, is having that data, um, and then we also have it available in a viewer here, uh, broken down into some different things. So sorry, Bert, you can go to the next slide. Um, so the existing infrastructure, existing features tab shows existing bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure such as bike lanes and shared use paved paths. So you can click on any segment and see um, what facility type is there currently. Um, on the next tab, 
Uh, the plan features tab shows bicycle and pedestrian in infrastructure that appears on local and regional active transportation plans. Um, and you can, so you can click on segments in your area of interest and explore planned facilities. Those are all taken from um, adopted local and regional active transportation plans. And then the next tab is the future AT network tab. This shows um, our, the envisioned active transportation network for our region, sort of the, the ideal situation if we were to build all of the, um, you know, maintain all the current facilities and build all of the planned ones. <laughs> it's, uh, but it, it's a lot different than what's existing today. There's a lot planned. Um, and sorry, all the planned, all the planned infrastructure is identified on adopted AT plans. So it's not just like a, I hope this goes here. It's actually on a plan. <laughs> it's legit. Um, next, next step. There's um, a couple of the next three tabs are additional active transportation related planning data, such as um, bicycle and pedestrian demand. Um, if you could go to the next slide, thanks. So bicycle and pedestrian demand tabs show the demand for walking and bicycling on any given road segment based on a number of demographic land use and proximity factors. Um, for example, proximity factors are like schools, proximity to schools, parks, that sort of thing, colleges, anything that would draw a lot of bicycle or pedestrian activity. Um, so you can click on a segment and see the demand score, the actual demand score from the model, and then the factors breakdown. If you scroll down in the pop-up, you can see the, the factors breakdown for each segment. And on the next tab, network quality um, shows the level of traffic stress for bicycling. Uh, level of traffic stress is calculated using lane count, speed, and traffic volume. So you can click on any segment and see the factors break down for that. Um, this was also, uh, UDOT was originally um, ran this analysis, and so we have uh, thanks to, to UDOT for sort of the beginnings of this, and this is a, an updated version of that. Um, and then the last tab in this application is the Wasatch Bike Plan, and this just connects you with information about local active transportation plans in our region. So you can click on the city and see if an active transportation plan has been funded or completed. You can get access to the plan document and learn about how the plan was funded there. So it's just sort of a um, all-encompassing active transportation data resources viewer, and um, and there's in in the info tabs on this application there's uh, links to the actual data that you can download and use um, and just some further information about it. So um, we hope that that's really helpful. Um, we're updating and maintaining these resources regularly, so please help us distribute accurate data. If you have any feedback or suggestions, um, contact me regarding AT data for your city. Just let me know if there's something that needs to be changed or something new or, you know, something that we missed. So um, we'd appreciate that help. And then the, um, oh, the, the link has been on all of those slides, just um, wfrc.org slash AT map, if you can remember that, or it's in our, our map gallery as well. Um, and then the next application is our new parks, park and trail accessibility map. So this is um, a high level overview of park space in our region. It's a planning tool to help cities determine where they stand in terms of park space and park accessibility. Uh, tab one here shows total park space by city, park space per capita, and a comparison to the World Health Organization urban park space recommendations. Um, it also shows park space per capita in 2050 based on population projections. Cities with high growth projections may need to um, or can use this to, to look at adjusting their park planning to ensure there will be enough park space for future residents. Um, on the next tab, accessibility is an equally important measure for urban parks. Tab two shows a 10 minute walk shed from park access points. So you can click on a city to see, any city to see the percentage of households that are within that um, 10 minute walk shed, uh, households that are within a 10 minute walk to a park. Uh, the next tab shows um, trails, uh, sorry, trails and pathways provide additional park-like space. Um, and this tab, you can click on your city to see the miles of paved pathway available. Um, on tab next, yeah, similar to tab two, tab four shows the, we, we were like tabbed maps here, just saying. <laughs> uh, tab four shows the 10 minute walk shed to trail heads and uh, trail access points. So um, you can again click on any city to see the percentage of households that are within that 10 minute walk shed uh, to a trail or a trailhead or a trail access point. 
Um, and the last tab, tab five, is just a combined park and trail access view, sort of um, getting the whole picture of things and enables users to focus on the gaps in accessibility to these important resources. So I think showing, um, showing the parks and walk sheds all together, um, what stands out to me is, is really the gaps in where um, there's not accessibility within a 10 minute walk or quick bike ride to a park. Um, so the link is, is on there and it, this, this map is also available from our map gallery. Um, and then one more thing on the next tab, please, or the next slide, thank you. Uh, finally, we're, we're working on an application showing taxable sales comparisons from 2019 to 2020. Um, this will include tax, total taxable sales as well as taxable sales broken down by category, for example, restaurants and bars, or non-store retail, which is a proxy for online sales. Um, as you can imagine, there have been some drastic changes in sales patterns due to the pandemic. So this is a really interesting data set and hopefully really useful for people. Um, so look for this in our map gallery in the coming month or so. And I'll um, go back to Bert, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, I, um, between what, you know, Matthew and Nicole and I have shown um, kind of get a sense for the, the breadth of things that we're, we're working on and also um, the importance of us coordinating and working with um, GIS that's happening at the city and county level uh, and then also state partners. Um, so, um, you know, most of what we've shown um, is featured in um, our WFRC map gallery and um, also our WFRC open data site. Um, pretty easy to get to WFRC.org, um, maps and, and data, and you can access our, our data portal there and map gallery from, from maps. Um, pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, one second, hang on, I lost one place. Um, so hit that. Um, I think uh, one of the things we're working on, this is kind of another coming soon thing, but like in the next couple of weeks, um, is trying to, to communicate sort of the data world, the set of data sets that um, are, are value, valued and being maintained um, and put to use in, in different planning contexts. And so this is just, um, these are just three sets of slides, um, but uh, we'll share this and we'll try and figure out a way to park this with active links so that others can, can, um, can kind of see this universe of possibilities. But I've, I've grouped the, the data that we use and or some of these things we actually may help maintain um, into, uh, I think it's four or five categories, access to opportunities related data, uh, land use related data, um, the transportation specific data, things like traffic volumes, commute times, um, the projects that are planned in the short range and the, the long range, some of the, the partner data that UDOT and UTA have, uh, the active transportation data that, that Nicole mentioned. That just um, an aside, that data offering has really come a long way uh, in the last, uh, I'd say 12 to 18 months, um, thanks to the work of Nicole and also Matthew, and then um, some of the things that UDOT and AGRC have done as well. Um, and then the last two categories are economic development related um, data sets, things like opportunity zones, um, the sales tax uh, work that we're doing now to compare quarter to quarter or year to year sales for, for quarter, um, for specific quarters as the tax commission puts those out. Um, equity focus areas uh, where um, we've got to do an extra good job of planning um, to make sure that we're delivering transportation and land use services to different um, historically disadvantaged areas. And then kind of a general set. And you know, in putting this together and, and we'll find a home for this to share it and make it dis discoverable. In thinking about this, you know, when you're doing GIS, half the battle is knowing what's out there and what you can um, connect with and use uh, versus, you know, um, building, having to take the time to build it yourself. And um, we're going to try and translate these slides into 
some kind of a web presence that lets people sort of discover all of these different resources. And we'll try and share that out with the Slug, uh, work with Slug to share that out using their mailing list when we've got that done. All right, well, that's what we've got. Um, just wanted to say uh, thank you for having us. And, um, uh, you know, we're happy to be a data resource for you. If you think there's some data out there um, and want to um, get in contact with us to, to bounce some thoughts around or ask some questions um, or give us feedback, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. We really, the strength of what we do um, or the, the, what we do is built on the strength of our ability to work with everyone else in the GIS community to put this type of information together and share it with um, decision makers and the public. So we'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Bert, Nicole, and Matthew. Appreciate that, guys. And um, Christina, do you know if we have someone from music? Yeah, Nick is here. I saw him on the list. Great. Yeah, Nick, if you want to give us a five minute update, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Sorry about that. I was clicking the wrong button. <clears throat> um, yes, so we're, we're still looking at possibly in May doing another conference and um, we'll see how it goes. We'll just see how this, everything kind of happens, but we have kind of held out the, the area at Bryce for the second week of, of uh, May, but um, you know, it's, we're all just kind of at the uh, beck and call of this pandemic. So don't really know what to say. Um, but I, I, I would, I'd have to say that everything's going fairly well. I, I thought our, uh, our conference online conference went pretty well. So I, we're thinking about doing some, maybe some shorter conferences, maybe that way, uh, kind of a, maybe another look, uh, a different way of doing like smaller conferences and uh, just to get to everybody on what everybody's kind of working on. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, I, I actually uh, really appreciate the presentation that we, that I just seen um, in my new position right now at this city. Those are a lot of the things you guys are bringing up are things they're asking for. So that's super cool. I don't know what you guys are working on. That's where we're at. Thanks. Well, thanks, Nick. Yeah, I agree. the The virtual UJ conference was awesome, and look forward to seeing new, uh, more stuff. And hopefully, uh, things work out where we can do a Bryce Canyon meeting in, in May because that'd be cool. Um, so yeah, I just want to jump into the next presenter here. Uh, Haley Miller with Esri will be talking next. So Haley, if you want to share your screen and get started. Super quick before Haley starts. Oh, sorry. Hey guys, yeah. If you have questions. Um, Type them into the group chat. There's like a raise hand feature. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so if you do have questions, that might be the best way to ask them. I will just keep an eye on them and, and we'll make sure your questions get asked to the right people during this meeting. So um, that's a great way to, to, um, to ask your questions. Just stick them in the chat and uh, I'll bring them up so that the presenters can focus on what they're presenting. Go for it, Haley. Perfect. Yeah, and feel free to interrupt me at any time, Christina, if any questions do come up. Um, but I am going to talk to you all about ArcGIS field maps. Um, can you all see my screen? Yep. I think I see some head nods. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. So before I jump into ArcGIS field maps, I just want to introduce myself because I do recognize some people on this call, but um, quite a few people that I don't know. Um, so my name is Haley Miller. I'm a solution engineer at Esri. I support all cities, counties, and regional governments in Utah. Um, and so some of you may know Joe Peters. He's uh, supporting Arizona now. So I'm same role as him. I'm a technical resource for um, you all on this call. And um, if I don't know you, please feel free to reach out, even just shoot me an email and the email's up on that slide right now, just introducing yourself. Um, I am super lucky. I've been supporting Utah since January of this year, and it's kind of a coveted um, state to support on our team out of the Denver Regional Office because you all have such a strong GIS community and there's been so much growth and innovation 
um, with all of the users that I've worked with so far. And um, so I feel really lucky to be supporting you. And I really like to show all of the work that you do off to my team um, and to the region and also to the whole, um, to our like national calls as well. So please reach out. Um, my favorite thing about my job is supporting the users and helping you all solve problems or putting apps together. So yeah, just wanted to start off with that. Um, but ArcGIS Field Maps, this is our new application. It was released last month and it is in the App Store now. You can go in and download it um, right now if you'd like. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a, a pretty high level overview and then a quick demo of it um, and then, you know, we can go from there if there's any questions or you can reach out to me and we can always have conversations in the future about it as well. Um, so Esri started building Collector for ArcGIS in 2014 um, and it really became the foundation of our field operations initiatives. And then as more users started adopting our field apps, um, we started adding a lot more capabilities and we followed the path that was set by a lot of other software companies like Apple and Google, where we built focused apps for different activities or capabilities. Um, and so the apps that you see here on my screen were built from our core ArcGIS runtime SDKs. And they're really the foundation of our uh, field operations platform and story. Um, and then there's also some additional applications that have more specialized focuses like Survey123, Quick Capture, um, Mission Responder, ArcGIS Indoors, Business Analyst Mobile, etc. Um, and so those we're not really going to be talking about uh, today in terms of the field maps application. Um, but we, what we did find is that organizations we're not very stoked on deploying all these different apps to complete a workflow. It's a little bit cumbersome. And mostly because, you know, involved downloading each app separately from the store, you have to sign into each app and then link them all together. Sometimes you'd have to download copies of data multiple times for different apps um, and things like that. And so that's why Esri, um, took these core apps and consolidated them into one app that can be used to complete all of those activities. And that's where ArcGIS Field Maps comes in. Um, and so this is happening over some phases, um, but right now um, I'll kind of go into what is already uh, incorporated into the Field Maps application and what's to come. Um, but then in the meantime, we're still going to be maintaining the specialized applications that you see on the bottom right of the screen. Um, and those will still be separate and on their own um, kind of individual applications. But what you're going to see combined into the field maps apps are all of the capabilities from ArcGIS Explorer, ArcGIS Collector, ArcGIS Tracker. Those three are already in the field maps application. And then to come is ArcGIS Workforce and then Navigator. Um, and so this is gonna bring all of these apps together as a solution for exploring maps, for high accuracy data collection, for location tracking, and then soon work management and navigation as well. Um, so really the key benefits of field maps is, first of all, the single app, for deploying as well as learning. So our mobile workers will only have to learn how to use one application and the people who are deploying these will only have to do it kind of once in one place. Um, the one-time sign-in I think is a huge benefit. I don't know, I know that um, I'm sure some of you struggle with lots of usernames and passwords and things like that. So just being able to do it once and stay signed in on your device, I think it's gonna be really, really valuable. Um, and then eliminating the duplication of off offline content, as well as just having to download that one app is really going to reduce the storage required um, to combine these different apps and, and have your final workflow. And then finally, the consistency across apps, you know, they're all going to be talking to each other all in one place when we're performing edits um, and things like that. 
So just to dive in um, to um, kind of what's available with the mobile application um, and field maps in general. So first we have a mobile application and what you see in gray is what's to come. So right now you can view maps, you can collect and update data, you can record and share your tracks, and then we can access indoor mapping um, capabilities as well. And then soon we'll be able to receive and complete work assignments and access that turn by turn navigation. Um, but in, in addition to the mobile application, there's also a field maps web application. And this is in beta right now. Um, but in there, we can simplify our map deployments because we're doing it all in one place. And this is where we're going to configure and deploy those maps to be used in the field map application, mobile application. Um, we can manage the offline content and um, those footprints and things like that. Um, we can create and preview smart forms. So this is a new capability where we can incorporate logic into um, our editing and our attributes and things like that, uh, which we'll see in action in my demo. And then soon, this is where we'll also be able to dispatch and manage work and assign workers to um, different work. So diving in a little bit deeper to what this means, um, first of all, we can still access maps anonymously. So if maps are public, we're able to browse maps and um, map packages without signing in, um, like we could do in Explorer. So you don't necessarily need a named user um, if maps are public, just to kind of see some data. Um, for map viewing, for those with maybe a viewer license, they can view the maps as they update in real time um, and search within those maps. They can also still mark up those maps so they can do freehand sketches um, and marker placement and then share those um, by email and things like that, those markups, but it's not going to edit those feature layers. Um, then if we are uh, have a field look, worker license or a creator license, we'll be able to do some high accuracy data collection like we see in Collector, capturing point lines and polygons, um, and then even integrating external GPSs for more high accuracy data collection. And then the smart form editing for inspections, that's a new feature into ArcGIS field maps um, where we can support conditional visibility and some logic into what shows up. Um, and then if you do have premium apps like Tracker for ArcGIS and um, ArcGIS Indoors, we can view, record, share, um, monitor our location tracks, and then also it supports that indoor mapping um, as well. So I'm going to dive into a demo. I'm going to actually share my phone screen for this. So um, let me stop sharing here. And then I will share from my phone. All right, there we go. So I'm going to jump into my ArcGIS field maps application. Um, and here we go. We, go, we jump right into a map that I've created for a demo. Um, so efficiency and accuracy are critical to effectively coordinating our operations at utilities. Um, and so you may be using some current apps like ArcGIS Quick Capture or Survey123, um, but then we've combined some of those other apps into one and that's what we're seeing right here. So um, in here, it's, what we're seeing right now first is just to view and understand the specific details about the utilities, right? So we're just looking at the default extent of my map. Um, but then let's dive in to like look at some more information about this valve. Um, so we'll dive into this valve at the end of the street here. And so when I click on this valve, um, we're going to get some information about it. So first we have just some attributes here, but we also have a valve maintenance record. 
Um, and so when we look at the uh, maintenance records over the last few years, um, we can see, you know, when maintenance has been done. So we see some was done uh, last January, for example. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and collect uh, features. So we see my location right here. Um, so we can use high accuracy GNS, GNSS receivers um, for this or just our phone, you know, GPS. And so let's collect a newly installed asset, like a system valve here. So we can do this with two taps. I'm just gonna click here, and then I'm gonna select system valve, because that's what we're collecting. Um, so now we have to enter some information about the valve, and um, we can do this and place it into logical groups to simplify the data entry. So when, um, when I get this drop down here, we can see that we have some different groups here. We have a general information group and then a status details group. So first I'm gonna set the um, valve type. So right here, it's not set and we're gonna set it as, oops, I'm gonna go into low power mode. We're gonna set it as a gate valve here and then I'm gonna click submit. And now we see, um, we can't see it right now because this is my location is right above it, but we have this um, system valve that is a gate valve now added here. Um, snapping also ensures the proper placement of these new features. Um, and so I'm gonna add a main to connect this valve to one at the far end of the street and then fill some information out about it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Click this collect features button. And this time I'm gonna select main, which is gonna be a line here. Um, and then we have snapping integrated, so it's gonna snap right to that point, and I'm gonna go ahead and add the point there. So um, now we can add some information about this main type here. So right now what we see is just some general details, right? So we don't have that much information here to enter. So I'm gonna select distribution main here, and now you see this logic is incorporated where these distribution main details pop up. So depending on the type of main, we're gonna get different, a different, um, another set of details to fill out. Um, it's also going to uh, fill these values in with the default values here. Um, so if those are good to go, we don't have to edit these. I can click submit. And now I have that main added into my map. Haley, we do have a question if you're at a good breaking point for a second. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is from Heidi Harris. So she says, we've had some difficulties using collector field apps with the new utility network for clients, mostly due to branch versioning not being supported. Do you know if and when that support is coming? Is there a workaround or do we simply have to tell clients they have to edit to default? That is a really good question. I would have to check back on that um, to know if it's going to be incorporated. Um, I believe that it should be. The intention is to be able to use branch, branch versioning, excuse me, um, specifically through ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, and so I'd have to check on that. I think it was Heidi that asked the question. Heidi um, Harris, yep. Heidi Harris, feel free to shoot me an email um, and then I can check in with our product team and get back to you on what that looks like in the roadmap. It's a awesome. good question. Thanks, yeah, no problem. Um, so from here, I'm just gonna click on this other valve here um, and we're gonna update this valve at the end of the road. Um, so let's say that this yellow valve here, whoops, uh, needs to be updated because there is ongoing construction. So we wanna update this as closed. So I'm gonna go in and I can click edit right here. Um, and then the present status, I'm gonna change to closed. And now this notes is gonna pop up right here, um, similarly using that logic. And in here, I can use uh, the voice recognition and record my voice. 
icon or I can type in. So I'm going to say oops, valve closed due to construction. And I'm going to go ahead and click submit. So what we've seen so far is really a lot of the collector type workflows, but I also want to show that we can do some of the explorer type workflows and mark up our map as well and share those. So if I go up here, I can go ahead and click markup. And so viewers are able to do this as well. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is just create a circle, say that houses are being added in this neighborhood right here. So we'll Put a circle there and then I'm going to add some notes. And we'll say construction and progress. Oh, it doesn't want to listen to me right now. I will just type it. Um, I think maybe because I'm on the Zoom. So we can type that and click done. Um, and now we have this markup as well that we can share. Um, next, I just want to show how Tracker is incorporated. So we can click on the GPS up here and turn on Track My Location. Um, so we can, we've seen data being viewed and collected, but we can also let users share their locations with the managers throughout the day to improve coordination between field crews and things like that. So if I just go and click this, now my location is going to be being tracked. Um, now I'm going to turn on the My Tracks in these layers here. And right now my location is being simulated, so this is not where I actually am because I'm in Denver. But I'm going to zoom out and zoom into Denver so we can take a look at what those tracks look like. Um, so if we go into Denver, um, now we can see my tracks for the day. I walked around my apartment building today um, at 1038 shortly before um, this call. And so we can see that I was walking um, and I walked around the building. Um, so that is the field maps application, kind of a high level of some of the things that you can do with it. I'm gonna stop sharing here and go back to sharing my computer screen now. So I'm gonna jump in with another question while you're switching. Yes, please do. Um, Lenise Hendrickson asks, with field maps, do you configure location profiles and providers for high accuracy data collection the same way you would in Collector? Yep. Yeah, but you will do it through the field maps web application, um, but it's going to look a lot like the interface that you uh, see for Collector. Any other questions? Not that I've seen at this point. <laughs> okay. All right. I am going to jump in here and just show you a water distribution system overview dashboard. Um, so this is kind of just regardless of any apps that you're using in the field. Um, you know, your crews and assets can be visualized in a dashboard um, to increase that coordina coordination um, and so that people back in the office can monitor these things. Um, and kind of get a common operating picture. So if you see here, I can quickly kind of see what's going on with my assets and my field crews and any open work orders um, that we see right here. Um, so if we dive into a work order here, it's gonna zoom in on that and give us some more information. Um, so it says that there is a main break, which would be an urgent issue, which would require an immediate response. And so right here, I see the locations of my field workers. So I can see uh, kind of who's nearest, who's closest to this issue. Um, so in, in this example, it's Jonas. He's about a mile away. Um, so I can talk, contact him first and let him know about the break. Um, and then Mike, you know, maybe can, I can let him know if his support is also needed kind of as a backup. Um, and then as this situation unfolds, I can be able to understand some nearby assets. So I clicked on fire hydrants here um, so I can better understand, you know, service connections and fire hydrants in this area to better understand what might may be impacted when this leak is going to be isolated, right? So we can kind of just zoom in um, and get a good picture from there. 
Um, so this is kind of just an overview of connecting that application with a desktop app. The last thing that I did want to show um, is just the field maps web application really briefly. Um, and so, like I said, this is still in beta, but when we do open it up, we can go to our specific map um, and then we can see the content that is within um, this map. And so when I dive into editable layers, I'm just gonna open up the main, for example, because I know that there was some logic incorporated in that piece of my demo. Um, and this is going to be where you set up some of those attributes and what things you want to be shown to the field crew and how they can edit things. Um, so right here, we have some logic based on the main type, right? So if we type in distribution main, we're gonna get these questions. In transmission main, we're gonna get these questions. And you might notice that these questions look the same, but what's gonna be different is those default values that fill in. Um, and so this is where we're gonna configure that conditionality. Um, and we're able to do that through expressions and arcade expressions and things like that. So right now, Thing. If the feature um, of main type is distribution main, then this is what we want to show. So similar to how you would incorporate logic in survey one, two, three, for example. Um, so that's kind of all that I have for field maps. I will stop sharing now. Um, and I'm not sure how I did on time, but like I said, uh, my email, I can toss it into the chat window as well, but feel free to ask any questions about field maps um, or even just any other parts of the GIS platform, um, the Esri platform. I'm happy to help out and um, I'm super stoked to be on this meeting and I hope to come to more in the future um, because like I said, this is the coolest GIS community <laughs> definitely that I've seen. So I'm just, Happy to be here and yeah. Awesome. Haley, I do have a question. Can I ask yeah, one? Please. Um, so in the dashboard that you showed, you had work orders. So were those through um, workforce? Yeah, so these that I'm showing here are, I can't remember if we made these through workforce. I don't believe so. Um, but these can be configured in a few different ways. So you can do it through workforce. Um, you can also do it through like third-party systems as well. Um, so it kind of depends on how, you know, your utility system is connected. And then, you know, if you have a separate work order system that you want that data and you have a service for it and you want that data to be feeding into the dashboard, you can do that as well. Okay, okay sweet, thanks. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Haley. That was really awesome. And I'm looking forward to the field maps getting out of the beta stage to production. So that'd be cool to, to use that. Yeah, um, us too. Yeah, I bet. Do you know when it may be in the production stage? Um, so I think for like the workforce and navigator, I think that it, they're probably shooting for um, next June. Cool. Great. Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, um, our next little segment, Zlatko, do you have a, a humor video to share with us? Yes, I do. Great. Let me share my screen. Can you all see that? I see it. Yep. Okay. Good play it.
Get Lost mode activated. During the next kilometers, advance until you lose sight of the city. It is forbidden to circulate while wearing a tie. Say goodbye to your paid life. Remember, in case of mud, you are not allowed to avoid it. Enjoy. Your boss's office doesn't have this view. Advance 50 meters and turn whatever you want. Congratulations. You're lost. Okay, it was a short one. I hope you all enjoyed that. That was awesome. That's pretty appropriate for today's times too and if you want to buy a jeep it's like coke and can hook you up <laughs> cool thanks Latko. that was good and short um our next talk adrian sellers with udot uh, adrian if you want to share your screen and take us away sure thing thanks everyone um it's nice to see so many familiar faces here um it's been it would be great to see everyone but hopefully soon. Um, so my name is Adrian Sellers. I'm a GIS administrator with UDOT and I work in the Central Construction Group. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about electronic ticketing. Um, so a quick overview. Is this presenting correctly, Adrian? Okay, cool. Um, so a little bit about UDOT. We are the Utah Department of Transportation. We have four regions throughout the state and a central office. Um, and pertaining to construction, we have 17 RE crews, so that's 17 construction crews throughout the state, uh, which consists of 30 full-time inspectors and 500 cross-trained inspectors who go from maintenance to <clears throat> construction each season, and over 1,800 employees statewide. So we maintain over 6,000 miles of roadway within the state, and we average for the past three years about 135 projects a year. So. A lot of people out there doing a lot of work um, and we're happy to support them and help them um, using GIS. So uh, one project that has been able to support these crews throughout the past couple of years that we've had a big initiative with is electronic ticketing. So for every asphalt paving project, there's a lot of paper tickets involved. So every time a truck driver pulls up, he would normally hand a paper ticket to an inspector and that inspector, he, uh, he or she, they crumple it up and stick it in their back pocket, maybe lose it in the backseat of their truck, write some notes on it, and um, file the way to never be looked at again. So part of UDOT's, uh, our executive director, Carlos Braceres' top goals is to become a paperless agency. So electronic ticketing helps us in that effort. Um, it also helps reduce these lost, damage, and illegible tickets that the inspectors um, maintain. And throughout this project, we're also trying to get some locations of where we're placing our largest asphalt money-wise throughout the state, which is asphalt. Um, and also safety workers. So who knew that uh, COVID-19 would benefit anything, but it did benefit this project in particular, because we had a lot more push from providers to make things be contactless. So um, kind of the system that we've been working on and setting up involves um, contactless transactions for getting these tickets to our inspectors. So um, it's a great safety feature for that. And also we're reducing putting these inspectors out um, in between trucks and pinpoints and different things. Um, when we had started thinking about this a couple of years ago, electronic ticketing, 
there are a lot of commercial vendors, and even more so this year, really jumped on board with trying to provide uh, software solutions to this problem. So um, there's a lot of pre-configured products out there, but they're all fairly expensive. And one thing at UDOT um, has been really gone full on on GIS, and we have been using Survey123 and Collector and other ESRI programs um, with a lot of our construction inspectors. So it's nice to try and give them a consistent product feel um, and not have to learn different applications as well. So what we did instead of purchasing a commercial product is we used some available solutions that we had in-house um, and configured them to do this process for us. So um, e-ticketing did require a lot of setup, but it was essentially free in that we pay for these licensing agreements. Um, and again, it gives a consistent feel to the applications that our inspectors are looking at. And we don't have to host data for any third parties, which is really nice. So uh, all of our e-ticketing efforts are stored in our enterprise geodatabase. So we all have access to this data and we can use it wherever we'd like. So when we think about the life of a paper ticket, so on a normal construction project, uh, when a truck leaves the plant, a ticket is generated, um, the truck is dispatched, the hot plant operator gives a paper ticket to the truck driver. The truck driver arrives at the project, they hand the ticket to the inspector, the inspector writes on it different things like temperature, they may write on it a station of where they're placing this material, um, any other relevant notes, like this, this truck showed up late, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they take these tickets, put them in a folder, and the office manager then has to manually tally them up to get sums and totals, and then associate them with our line items to pay these suppliers. So our thought for e-ticketing was to bypass a lot of this and do electronically. So how we ended up doing this, um, we set up some webhook type concepts where we can have URLs that the suppliers send JSON to, including that ticket information. Um, we then extract, transform, and load it using a program called FME into our Enterprise Geo database. Um, once that ticket is at our Enterprise Geo database, the inspector can view that information, add their additional information, um, and write it back, write that entry back. And then again, it's associated with line item payment. So we're kind of skipping a lot of the steps doing electronic ticketing. Um, just thinking about this as a little bit of a different workflow. So this, what we're looking at here is an example of a paper ticket. This is what you would get from a supplier on a normal occasion. So these highlighted fields are things that are important to UDOT to collect out there. So we want to collect where this asphalt is coming from, uh, the ticket number, the time, um, which vehicle it arrived in, what the product is, and any of the measurements as well. So how we ended up deciding to do this is that we created a JSON format that we've used across a few different suppliers. So they said, this is, this is the information we're looking for from the ticket. Um, we're looking for this particular JSON format. And then by setting up webhooks and URLs with feature manipulation engine, we're able to just have them send, as soon as they hit dispatch to send that truck out, they can send us this JSON, and then we move it right into our Enterprise Geo database. And then on the inspector's end, they are accessing it using Survey123. So we're using the inbox functionality of Survey123 to be able to look up a ticket, say that's the one I want, add their information, and write that information back. Um, so when the inspectors get into survey one, two, three, they just select their project that they're working on um, and they hit the inbox here and we have some queries set up so that only tickets that have not been inspected yet show up. And then when they get into the inbox here, they show this is the truck number. Um, this is the project it's going to, and this is the time it was sent out from the plant. So using that information, they can easily discern which is the correct ticket to inspect. 
Um, so they select the right ticket and then using the inbox and then it pulls up a lot of a different, whoops, a lot of different information here. So now all those fields that I showed earlier on the paper ticket are displayed here within survey one, two, three. So we're seeing here's the order ID, this ticket number, this one came from the West Haven Ogden plant. Um, it's half inch HMA with a 6434 binder. Um, and it came in August 8th at 1.50 a.m. And from there, they can add, this is the item number 27. Um, pin number is a thing that we use for projects to identify them internally. They can say, yes, I visually verified it. The asphalt was 270 degrees. We didn't take any samples. We didn't reject it. We didn't partially reject it. And if they have any notes about that load as well. <clears throat> So it makes it really easy for them. Um, we've had a lot of inspectors really like the feel of Survey123 and being able to use talk to text for the notes to add any relevant, relevant information and just being able to grab a general location of where this material is being placed. So once they get all this information, um, we feed it into a web map and a dashboard, which I can show you guys here. Um, so for example, we feed this back into a dashboard, the office managers, the resident engineers, anyone associated with the project that wants to know about this, they can do some queries here so they can find their project. They can say, um, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at the tickets from yesterday today. We don't have a ton of paving going on right now with the cold weather, but um, here's some paving happening down at Sand Hollow yesterday. So now we can see some approximate locations of lagging a little, where these things are showing up. So we can see uh, this sort of asphalt came from Staker Parson. It was the 38th load of the day. Um, it was inspected by J. Lowe, item number 80. Um, it was 360 degrees, 306 degrees when it arrived. It was not sampled, it was not rejected. So any relevant information. Um, and then from there, so we can try to get our suppliers paid faster, we can pull up the attribute table, which queries. Um, and we can actually just export this as a CSV, which makes it really fast for our office managers and staff to be able to grab sums on these tickets. So they can come in here to the sheet. They can um, quickly see all of the information for that day's paving. They can grab the quantities and sum those up and get that in and set to pay our suppliers. So we've actually sped our time up quite a bit with um, getting our suppliers paid, which has been a huge benefit as well. Um, so some other benefits to our contractor. Um, these are our partners so far that we've worked with. Um, we've also been working with Bill Gore as well. Um, so we share this information back through feature layers that are queried out for each specific contractor. So we share this information back to them. Some of them take this info, they put it into a Power BI dashboard, they can slice it and dice it any way they'd like. And so now they can get some, some reconciling information so they can kind of figure out their cycles a little better about how many loads are reaching the projects and how fast they're getting there so they can learn a little bit more about their data and help deliver us a better product as well. Um, so for this year alone, oh yeah, please. Sorry, sorry. Um, our, the question was from Gary Christensen, are you using FME server, desktop, or cloud services? So we're creating the workflows in FME desktop and we're publishing them up to FME server. So we have an FME server instance on-prem and we have eight cores on that. Um, so it's pretty beefy. We do a lot of different things with our FME server like um, vehicle tracking, um, any sort of ETL workflow we have at UDOT, we usually run it through our FME server now. Um, so if you have any more questions about FME server and how we set it up and how we utilize it, feel free to reach out to me as well. More than happy to talk through that. Um, so, so far in 2020 alone, this is our second year 
using e-ticketing. Um, we've received over 19,000 electronic tickets, which represents about 663 tons of asphalt. So um, we're saving a lot of paper. We're saving a lot of time on our office manager's side. Um, and we're creating some good information. So we actually had a project in that we looked at on the dashboard there in St. George where they had some reject paving that had to be pulled out. And they were able to easily look back at that locations that their inspectors obtained to see, okay, this is about where we need to pull this paving out and repave. So um, it's been useful and pretty quick to get things done. Um, and it's been a, a really fun project to work on and a fun thing to deploy. So that, that was a really fast presentation. So please, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free. Great, Adrian, thanks, that was really cool. And I, I had a question, what, how receptive were the, the guys who do these tickets when this first came out versus doing the paper, the paper submission? Um, so I think that might be a, a subject of how old they were. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hate to say it, but um, the uh, the younger inspectors really took to it fast that are more savvy on their phones. Um, it made it easy for them to just be able to pull it out of their pocket and say, here's the ticket. Here's my notes done. I don't have to carry a clipboard anymore or anything like that. Um, it, there's always going to be some pushback with um, larger changes like this and how we do things. So, um, it the, people are coming around though, and it's been pretty receptive. And had a good cool, yeah, glad to hear it. And it's, I think it's cool. And you're you're promoting safety as well. Yeah, COVID nineteen really kicked this up. That um, <laughs> a lot of these suppliers were wanting to do contactless ticketing. So we said we could do that. Um, you know, you can just figure out how to send us JSON. We will make it happen. Cool. Well, yeah, that, that about wraps up everything we have. If, if there's any last minute questions, um, raise your hand, throw it in the chat box. Um, if you have questions after the fact, um, I hope everyone is getting our emails that we send out for these announcements, for these, these webinars and, and all of our announcements. If you're not, uh, you can find us on, on our website. It's slug-gis.com info i think or just google slug gis i have i have to do that to find a website sometimes but you can reach you can reach out reach out to us on there and you can also um sign up for our newsletter and things like that we do not have a set date or time yet for the next time we're meeting probably february march time frame something like that uh, if you have ideas for presentations we would love to hear it um, they could be casual, short, long, it doesn't matter what they are. If you're working on something that you think could benefit others, it, it likely would benefit others. And I, le I know I learned a lot from all of this. And um, if, uh, if you have any ideas, just let us know and you can start putting it together now, maybe, or in a month or two or three. Um, but in any case, I appreciate everybody for coming and have a good rest of the year. See y'all later. And thanks for seeing all our presenters. Appreciate it, guys.